Have I missed anybody? He speak up if I did. All righty. Now let's get to the uh, to what we're all here to hear about, and that is the whole issue of rank choice voting. Again, uh, a potential issue for the Business for Democracy collaboratives uh, to advocate for in their states, uh, and 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 why we we sh might want to get behind this and. The, two great experts on this. Again, Nathan Lockwood, executive director for the national campaign Rank the Vote and Rachel Hutchinson, research analyst with Fair Vote. And I'm gonna turn the whole thing over to Nathan. Go ahead, Nathan. All right, well, thank you so much, Frank. It's wonderful to be with, with all of you today. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm really excited to be doing this presentation with Rachel as well, uh, who, you know, we work really closely with Fair Vote and, uh, this is the first presentation I've had a chance to do with Rachel. Our, our previous, previous collaborations, I think, have been restricted to uh, being comments with colleagues after a f event for Fair Vote. So very excited about that. Um, really excited to be talking to Business for Democracy. You know, uh, so in, so uh, inspiring to hear small business owners uh, and people involved with small businesses um, getting involved in making sure our democracy is working well for everybody. Um, Small business owners are some of the most trusted voices in America. And so it makes me feel like uh, just hearing all of you today that our chances of winning uh, these important reforms like ranked choice voting just went up a few notches. And also really great to hear all the different places you're coming from and living in. Um, Rank the Vote, we work with uh, volunteer-led uh, state-based organizations in about 29 states. And it seems like somehow this call today, uh, we got folks from from some great states where some of our, our most active groups are. Uh, so really, really great to speak with you. Um, so uh, as, as Frank said, I'm with Rank to Vote. Let me just get our presentation and, and have Rachel introduce herself as well. I, Rachel, I, uh, I did make one change to the deck. I moved uh, your introduction up. So you're gonna introduce before you talk. So Rank to Vote, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit national organization. We work on rapidly building support for ranked choice voting. Rachel, do you want to take it away for a couple slides? Uh, oh. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Hutchinson. Um, I'm a research analyst at Fair Vote. It's super nice to meet you all and be here to talk about ranked choice voting today. Um, Fair Vote is a nonpartisan organization. Um, we do research and advocacy to advance reforms that make American democracy more fair, representative, um, and give voters more choice and more voice. Um, I'm currently calling in from Chicago, so it's really nice to see people from all over. Um, but I will hand it back to Nathan for now. All right, great. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do do down there at uh, Fair Vote, Rachel? Yeah, so um, I'm a research analyst. Uh, so I do research and data analysis in support of Fair Vote's advocacy mission, much of which includes ranked choice voting. Um, I write reports, academic papers, um, respond to data, um, requests from colleagues in the space, um, advocates, communication folks, that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about sort of what we know about ranked choice voting in practice and how it might be relevant to all of you. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. So uh, yeah, I just got my screen shared. This is Rank to Vote. So I'm the director of Rank to Vote and a co-founder. We've been around uh, since the very end of 2019. I got involved in ranked choice voting uh, through a volunteer-led state organization in Massachusetts where I live. It was called Voter Choice Massachusetts. Um, and we we grew a very the largest state-based movement for ranked choice voting at the time uh, between 2016 and 2019. Um, and uh, so, so yeah. So now we we have a staff of staff of nineteen, and we currently and we're still growing. We have uh, people working with those uh, state based organizations now, in uh, eight states. So here's what we're going to talk about today. So why do American politics feel so broken? What's the root cause? And what can we do to fix it? Just some some basic questions about a really big and important issue. So let's start by looking at our current elections. And uh, folks um, folks on the phone may remember this. Can everybody see my screen okay? So I do some dumb things with screen share sometimes. Okay, good, good. All right, so we're gonna go back in the time machine to 2000, presidential election, George Bush, George W. Bush running against Al Gore. And uh, you know, longtime consumer advocate, Ralph Nader also running. Folks may remember this was a super close election, couldn't make it closer 
came down to the, the race in Florida and only 537 votes separating Bush and Gore. So in this contest with just a 537 vote difference, Ralph Nader, the third party candidate, gets about 100,000 votes. Now, we're lucky to have data of, from Florida for exit polls, which showed that of the Nader voters, uh, if Nader hadn't run, 45% would have preferred Gore, about 27 would have preferred Bush, and about 28% just wouldn't have voted, which means that net-net, had Nader not run, instead of Al Gore losing by about 550 votes, he would have likely won by about 18,000 votes, still a close race, but he would have won with a majority of support of Floridians, um, instead of what happened, which was George Bush um, winning with less than majority support, 49.6%. So kind of a weird outcome when the majority prefers one type of candidate, yet another candidate wins. That's not kind of what we think about when we think about voting in elections. And, you know, so not having the candidate that was preferred by the most voters wins, that's obviously problematic in its own sense. But there was arguably an even bigger problem when we look at this election, and that is when Ralph Nader was running, so this was not a complete surprise to all Americans. The Democrats were very nervous about Ralph Nader's participation, and the more so because he was a fairly credible candidate, well-respected, well-spoken, well-liked. And they were from the get-go saying, Ralph, don't run for the presidency. You're just going to ruin it for the Democrats, and you're going to give this election to the Republicans who, uh, whose positions are much different than yours. So don't run. And at the local level, you, if you were around then and voting then, you might have been sitting around the lunch table with friends and maybe somebody, one of your friends, maybe if you were a Democrat, one of your friends was really excited about Ralph Nader running and your Democrat friends at the table might have said, oh no, don't, don't waste your vote. Don't vote for Ralph Nader. You're just going to help elect the Republican. Uh, so essentially, in, now, so you'd like to say, this is not a great dynamic. We like to think of our democracy as a vibrant, open system where you know, people with different ideas can come and run, you know, run for something, represent the community, find out, use the process to find out what we care about. But instead, we have a process here where there's pressure to exclude voices, even people who think similarly to you, because our election system, which works okay when only two people won, run, immediately starts to break down when you add that additional third voice. So what this election here in Florida shows us is a problem with our current system, which is that it discourages people from running and discourages choice for voters. So I just talked a lot about the Democrats getting kind of um, getting hurt by our current system. It's kind of an equal opportunity punisher. We'll just quickly look back at 1992 when George H.W. Bush was running against Bill Clinton and uh, historically strong independent Ross Perot was in the mix as well. Now, if you look at interviews with uh, George Bush's staff, they're furious about the impact that uh, Ross Perot's uh, campaign had on their efforts uh, to, to win re-election. They feel that Ross Perot is a pro-business conservative, uh, penalized George Bush much more than Bill Clinton, and that had Perot not won, they believe uh, Bush would have been re-elected. So how often does this really happen, the spoiled elections? So, between 1992 and 2019, and thank you to uh, Rachel and the Fair Vote Research Department for this fact here, 49 U.S. senators from 27 states were elected with less than majority support in general elections. So, so we don't really know if they were the candidate that uh, was preferred by the majority or not. They just weren't able to demonstrate it, though. Uh, another problem with our current elections is it's not just general elections, it's also primaries. And we're using some high profile presidential examples, but Rachel could show you the data. This happens up and down the ticket, you know, from president all the way down to dog catcher, you know, so federal, state, and local levels. So folks might remember back in 2016, the unlikely ascent of Dr Donald Trump through the Republican Party. Um, and it was, it, for many at the time, kind of a head scratcher. But if we go back and we look at the primary elections, he was winning and building momentum. Um, he was winning these early primaries with far less than majority support. In many cases, like New Hampshire, the first primary in the US, 35% of the vote. Now, how, how did he do that? How did he win with 
Well, if you look at the top of this slide, you'll see that the more traditional Republican candidates, and there were a lot of them, were fragmenting their common base of support. They were fragmenting the support of Republican primary voters who wanted a more traditional Republican candidate. And you can imagine how frustrating that was for those candidates, for the people who supported them, to see their party sort of getting taken over by a faction that didn't have clear majority support within the party. Uh, but that's precisely what happened. And of course, as time went on, the field winnowed. And um, because none of these candidates, other candidates could get traction, Trump's campaign took on a feel of inevitability. So how, how often do we have non-majority primary winners? Well, it's actually a big, a, a big phenomenon. Of 435 representatives in Congress, less than half won their first primary with majority support. Um, this is partly because open seats for Congress, those primaries tend to get a lot of people throw their hat in the ring. So in fact, about 20% of these people representing Americans in Congress today won their first primary with 35% support or less. So another problem with our current system that folks uh, probably dislike as much as, as, as I do, I think uh, pretty much everybody hates this, is uh, polarization. So I don't know if folks have not completely blocked out of their memory the presidential debates from 2020, which was like, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe I was watching the stuff. They were talking over each other and yelling, um, but it really highlighted that the, the extent to which differentiation and disagreement is getting prioritized over common ground in our politics. And why is this happening? Because when you have an election and there's only two like choice, legitimate choices who can win, bashing your opponents a very legitimate winning strategy like that's that can often be better than trying to convince people that you're any good so let's let's go back to the primaries um so there's a number of organizations today in the u.s that are looking at the way we hold our public primaries um and how we do those elections as a major source of the polarization we see today so it starts so to set the table here when you look out at America, and Rachel and her team at Fair Vote have done great work on this, more than 80% of congressional seats are, quote, safe for one party, meaning it doesn't mean they're safe for Americans. It just means they're not competitive because, you know, because the way the district's drawn, who lives in the district, we know that that district's going to go Democrat or Republican. In this situation, the dominant party in, that, in each district, their primary is going to be the de facto general election. In a Republican district, whoever wins the Republican primary is going to win the election. In a Democratic district, same thing. Whoever wins the Democratic primary is a shoe in to win the election. And they win at rates of close to 100%, 98%, 99% of the time. So in addition, another feature of these important primaries that are determining the winners is that there's low primary voter turnout and no majority requirement, like we just discussed. You can win it with, like they did in my district, uh, Democrat won in Congressional District 3 in Massachusetts with 21% in 2018. Congressional District 4 in Massachusetts, 22% in 2020. That means these seats can be held hostage by a relatively small motivated partisan base. And you, you hear sometimes uh, different political figures, you know, talk about, you know, threaten uh, politicians that if they don't cater to their faction, they're going to get primaried which is like the last thing that any incumbent politician wants is to have to put up a vigorous defense against their own party in the primary. So what do the, what do these politicians do? They start to, you know, toe the line and take the positions that these powerful, small, small, but powerful factions want. So another manifestation of polarization in the U.S. is this phenomenon called negative partisanship. So what is negative partisanship? It's a, it's a situation where uh, Americans are liking their own party less and less <laughs> and hating the other party more and more. Not a happy situation. So this is kind of the ultimate result of these low choice elections where voters are more often voting out of fear and dislike for the other side, the lesser of two evils. There's only two choices. They don't not seeing something they absolutely love, but they, you know, they, they're seeing something they, they really dislike. And you know the toxic campaigning and polarizing primary incentives are just throwing fuel onto this fire of negative partisanship. 
So back to that, what is the root cause? Elections in America are supposed to be the backstop, the safety net, the corrective mechanism, the foundation of our democracy. But the way we do our elections now is actually making things worse. Our pick one voting system's failing. It's restricting freedom to run without being a spoiler for candidates. It's restricting freedom of choice in the voting booth. Uh, these elections are vulnerable to spoiler outcomes when more than two run. It's undermining the wishes of the majority of people by helping divisive candidates succeed in crowded primary fields. And it's distracting from healthy issue-based campaigns that uh, educate the American public and help us determine what constructive directions we need to go in. And so this is feeding division through a dangerous cycle of polarization and toxic partisan attacks, which is turning us all off from politics. So what is the solution? Well, uh, Nathan Lockwood, the director of Rank to Vote, is uh, going to make a shocking statement that the solution is ranked choice voting. One simple change. So what is ranked choice voting? And I apologize for that uh, House member here uh, in the background. Instead of picking just one candidate, ranked, with ranked choice voting, you can rank multiple candidates in the order you prefer them. So here's a ballot that looks like the ones we use right now. Um, so there's four candidates running. You have to figure out which one you want to vote for and pick them. Ranked choice voting is a simple extension of this ballot. We just add a few extra columns. And now instead of only being able to express how you feel about one of the candidates, you can rank all the candidates in the order that you like them. So how do you use a ranked choice ballot? Well, let's look at this dessert ballot here. Hopefully everybody on this call has some kind of opinion about these desserts. Uh, vanilla bean cake, brownies, cookies, fruit, or cheese. Um, just take a moment in your own mind to rank these desserts in the order that you would have them if, uh, if you had that opportunity at this moment. All right, so, you, you know, let's say brownies, your first choice, you fill in the number one bubble. But if you can't have brownies, you know, vanilla bean cake sounds pretty good. Second choice. All right, you don't have those kind of fancier things. All right, good old cookies will be good. Healthy stuff like fruit and cheese, I'll make that four and five. So that, that's my vote. I'm imagining that everybody found that pretty easy to do. Like we've been doing that since we were like maybe two. Uh, but how do you count these ballots? That's the, the tricky part. So super easy to vote. How do you count them? So in a couple of minutes, you're all going to be experts in counting ranked choice ballots. Thanks to this demonstration of the orange and purple people. Um, so how does this work? The, the key, the secret to counting ranked choice ballots is we only look at the first choices initially, all right? So we, we collect all the ballots from the election. They're, they're sitting in front of us here, a nice big pile of all of them. And now we're gonna sort them into piles based on who people's first choices were. And in this hypothetical election, um, you see what the results were with dark orange leading with 55%. Now our goal here is to figure out what candidate has the support of a majority. So in this case, 55%, that's a majority. So it was dark orange. Majority is more than 50%. So great, that, that was the same pretty much as the way we vote now, just counted the votes, got a winner. But what if there's no majority of first choices? What do we do now? This is where the ranked choice voting magic kicks in. So the way it works is we're going to say, well, if there's no majority, we wanna find out who the majority supports. So we're gonna eliminate the candidate with the least support. So in this case, it's like, sorry, light orange, you know, you're not going to make it this time. We're going to eliminate you. But light orange supporters, don't worry. Your vote still counts. We're going to count your ballot towards your next choices. So eliminate light orange, count the supporters of light orange, their ballot for their next choice. Interestingly, there's this affinity between the light orange voters and the dark orange, uh, dark orange voters. And so four out of five of those um, light orange voters had dark orange as their second choice. So we look at round two here, and we're talking rounds. Uh, Frank is from South Carolina. Some of the states in the US have these runoff elections. This is like a runoff election, right? Like we're, we're doing another round, but the difference is it's an instant runoff election. So you often hear ranked choice voting called instant runoff because you've already given, when you filled out that ballot, like that cookie ballot, you already told us exactly how you would vote in five different runoffs. So we're gonna, so we're able to just do this instantaneously, this counting. So back to our piles, I had these, these uh, ballots and these piles based on first choices. When I eliminated light orange, I took that pile of votes and I just put them on top of the pile of those voters second choices. So now it's 44, 36, 20, still not a majority. What do folks think we're gonna do? 
we're going to eliminate the least popular candidate that's left. That means bye-bye light purple. And we're going to count their supporters' ballots for their next choices with the result that now dark orange picked up another 1% to get 45% and dark pip purple picked up 19% and now has 55%. So guess what? We achieved our goal. We found out which of these four candidates a majority of the voters support. It's of course dark purple. And look at what we did here. Look at what ranked choice voting helped us do. Without ranked choice voting, we're feeling around in the dark. We get those first choice results and it's, oh. Well, Enjoy. 40% like forty percent like dark orange, but who does the majority like? We don't know. With ranked choice voting, we're able to surface the buried opinion in the majority and find out that actually, by a double-digit margin, these voters preferred dark purple. And so we're able to ensure that the right person gets elected, even though four people were running. All right. So that's it. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to counting ranked choice ballots. And if you have questions later, we can we can talk about that more. So with ranked choice voting, this is ranked, Maine was the first US state to adopt ranked choice voting for all state and federal elections. We no longer have this uh, Ralph Nader spoiler problem. In Maine, their first congressional election with ranked choice voting, they had a Democrat, a Republican, and two independents. Tiffany Bond and uh, I forget, uh, Ms. Richard Hoare. And they almost together got 10% of the votes. So in the first round, no majority, Pollockin just barely up on Golden by just a percent. But they did what we just talked about. They eliminated the candidates with no chance of winning. Whoops, sorry about that. And as a result, they were able to determine that when the independent candidate supporters' second choices were looked at, it was Golden that actually had a majority of support. Virginia Republicans love this stuff. They were looking at this big field here with Glenn, this was in 20. 2021, Glenn Youngkin was running for governor, Winsome Sears, a few others running. And, you know, the GOP in Virginia had had a few rough years, right? They were getting, they were getting beat. Um, and they were looking at this field and Amanda Chase, she was kind of a polarizing figure, self-described as Trump in heels, liked things like the insurrection at the Capitol. And Virginia Republicans were worried that she could become the face of the Virginia Republican Party. And if she did, it wouldn't be a good look for them. And they would definitely get beaten again in the race for governor. So they said, how can we find out who a majority of the Republicans in Virginia want to represent them? Well, we'll use this ranked choice voting thing that our Republican friends in Utah have been talking about. And so they did. And Youngkin won that election. He went on to an upset victory in the governor's race. And after that, the Virginia GOP said, ranked choice voting is our friend and we're gonna keep using it for congressional primaries. Australia has used ranked choice voting for over 100 years, and there was a pretty interesting thing that happened. There were some, you know, like in the U.S., we have these parties or these big tents, but within them, there's people with different opinions, and sometimes those differences of opinion get real strong. So in Australia, in their conservative party there, which is actually called the Liberal Party, but they're conservatives, uh, there were these uh, group of women candidates that were increasingly upset with the um, anti-climate um, nature of their party and the fact that there were a number of scandals uh, where women were getting mistreated within their party. So they said, you know, we don't have to take this. We have ranked choice voting. We're gonna form uh, a group. They were called the Teal Independents. Teal's like uh, green and blue put together. Uh, so these pro-business conservative women, pro-climate women broke away, ran for election and won. They won like, I don't know, 10 or 20 seats. It was a remarkable thing. And they could do that and, and build power for themselves on their own conservative path using ranked choice voting. All right, last thing, we talked about all the polarization. Ranked choice voting helps with that. The way it helps is, um, you know, this is Betsy Hodges ran for mayor in Minneapolis. Uh, she observed that when she ran in this ranked choice voting mayor election, there was relatively little, little elbowing and attacking because every candidate wanted to be the second choice of their opponent's supporters. That's a big deal. So when you're in a race and there's lots of candidates running and you need to get a majority, it's not enough to just get your supporters first choice you need to get your opponent's second or supporter second and third choice. So people have talked about how this even affects door knocking, right? Ra you know, raise your hand if you've door knocked for a candidate before. In our current elections, if you go up to a door and there is um, your opponent's sign in the yard, you're just gonna walk on by. There's no reason to stop the way we vote currently. 
in ranked choice voting elections, you're going to go up to that door, you're going to knock and you're going to say, you know, hi, my name's Nathan. Um, I'm campaigning here for uh, Rachel. Uh, I see you got a sign for Frank. I'd like to talk to you about the five things that Rachel and Frank agree on and ask you uh, to support Rachel as your second or third choice. Totally different dynamic. We're not trying to disagree. Rachel and Frank in their campaigns are no longer trying to disagree on everything imaginable. They're no longer trying to talk trash about each other. Uh, they're having a constructive discussion of the issues and making an affirmative case for each other and finding common ground. So voters consistently report less negativity in jurisdictions that use ranked choice voting. And there's been a number of studies here that um, I know uh, Rachel and her team could give you a ton more information about if you're interested. Um, ranked choice voting also helps solve that primary problem. Now, one of the exciting things about ranked choice voting right now, you're hearing about it more and more. We got tons of momentum. Um, you know, we won eight referendum out of 10 in November. And so there's more and more ranked choice voting. Folks might've heard about the election in Alaska uh, that just happened. So there's ranked choice voting is becoming so popular that there's different ways of doing it. It's not just like one cookie cutter way. Um, Maine used ranked choice voting. They just took their elections exactly as they were, but they used ranked choice voting rather than traditional ballots and used ranked choice voting counting. Alaska said, you know what? We've got an issue where people, too many people can't vote in the primaries. So we're gonna open up our primary system and then we're going to advance the top five candidates. We're going to have all the candidates run in one primary. All the voters are going to vote in the same primary. And then we're going to have the voters in the general election rank the top four candidates. And you could also do that with five. Like in Nevada, they just voted to, to do it for five. So with either of these, we're no longer anointing winners uh, by you know, having small partisan factions anoint winners in the primaries. Now the, the much larger general electorate, the general electorate is usually like, between three and five times larger than the primary electorate. Now they're getting the more choices over who's gonna represent them. Um, so we, the people get to decide. So it's, it's a, and you get with whichever form of ranked choice voting you're using, you're getting a better primary process for nominating candidates that have broad support. And that was what we saw in Alaska with moderate Republican, um, oh gosh, Lisa Murkowski, uh, defend her seat in a way she wouldn't have been able to in a primary process. She would have won, lost the GOP primary. We saw a really moderate Democrat uh, hold her own and in, in beat a couple of Republicans in a field that had Sarah Palin, who was a very unpopular candidate, but popular enough to win the Republican primary uh, with their base. Um, and so folks kind of saw in Alaska ranked choice voting doing what advocates said it would do, which was penalize very polarizing candidates and help more moderate candidates. Now, Alaska had a very conservative government governor who was also up for re-election, and he won his race because he the Alaskans were satisfied with him. And as we discussed, it, the ranked choice voting provides incentives for civil campaigning. So with that, I wanna thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, who's gonna to talk to you about some more important aspects of ranked choice voting. Uh, thanks so much, Nathan, that was great. Um, if I can ask you to go to the next slide, please. Awesome. Uh, so I'd love to give you a little overview about some of the key things we know about ranked choice voting in practice. It is tried and true. It's the fastest growing nonpartisan reform in the nation. Um, and because of that, we have proof that it works as intended. Uh, people are really buying into the system, shown by the fact that they're using rankings. Uh, they find it simple. They're satisfied and it's electing candidates that most voters can get on board with. Um, specifically, it's won 22 of the last 25 ballot measures. Uh, there's now 16 million people living in the 62 cities, counties, and states that have embraced ranked choice. Uh, a median of 71% of voters rank multiple candidates. For um, more highly competitive ones, it could be closer to 90. Um, in all ranked choice voting elections in the U.S. since 2004, 74% of people rank um, a candidate that eventually goes on to win in their top three. Uh, in New York City, where they used it um, in their mayoral primaries, 95% uh, of voters found it simple and over 75 want to use it again. Um, in Utah, where they use it for some municipal elections, 88% of reported feeling very satisfied or satisfied. Um, next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, so something uh, that I think might apply specifically to this group is I think that ranked choice voting really reflects free market values and that it essentially re-democratizes elections. Um, as Nathan described with the current system, new diverse startup candidates are incentivized against running so as not to split or waste votes. Um, and this lack of competition really incentivizes or limits the incentive for legislators to solve problems that are facing Americans. Um, if we've only got a couple of legitimate choices, the only job requirement requirement is to be a little bit better than your other opponent, right? Uh, so ranked choice voting restores competition because voters can't rely on fears of vote splitting to discourage new entrants, uh, and voters gain this newfound power to hold legislators accountable. This works just like it does in business. Uh, when we have more choices, those choices have to seriously compete to be the best. Um, in a grocery store, uh, we might be deciding which ice cream flavor we like best, and those companies have to actively innovate to stand out on the shelf to taste the best um, in order to stay in business. And the same thing goes for politics. Candidates can actively be the best um, by delivering results when elected, uh, by reaching more voters, by addressing issue salience across the spectrum, uh, but they only have reason to do so when they have other people People gunning for their seat and serious sort of competition. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I really like this quote from uh, business titan Mark Cuban. He's a big supporter of ranked choice voting. Uh, he says, this is exactly why I support ranked choice voting. It's a major step towards making politicians responsible to voters before and after they're elected, and it's a better model for the business of politics. Um, next one, please. Um, I think another particular benefit that could come out of ranked choice voting is making for a more stable business environment. Uh, when Congress or state legislators can't get anything done, uh, more policy tends to be made by the president or the governors uh, via executive orders. Uh, and as we know, especially with the presidency, it's especially always flip-flopping uh, between parties. Um, and businesses could have a hard time keeping up between that flip-flopping of regulations. In contrast, uh, policy made by Congress or state legislatures tends to last longer, see fewer dramatic changes, and that can really create a more stable business environment. Um, however, the structure of our elections is what's directly contributing to the polarization that has paralyzed Congress. With plurality voting, um, which is just our single choice one, uh, candidates often only need support from their existing partisan base to win. They don't need to reach out to voters across the aisle, and that removes the incentive to cooperate on legislation when in office. Uh, ranked choice voting, on the other hand, gives legislators an incentive to work across the aisle because they're mandated to majorities in their electorate and they have to reach across the aisle to attract alternate votes. Uh, more policy could be made in Congress and less by the executive branch. Uh, we have evidence that ranked choice voting is conducive to the legislative process. Nathan talked a little bit about Australia where they've used it for 100 years. Their parties are constantly making electoral and legislative coalitions based on their need to get alternate choice votes from each other's supporters. They're more willing to make policy concessions and work together, and this really helps grease the legislative process there and make it effective. Um, Nathan also mentioned Maine and Alaska are the two states that use ranked choice voting to elect their Congress people. Those congressional delegations are also ranked among the most bipartisan in the nation. Uh, so when we have legislatures that work, we're going to really have more durable policies, including those that affect business people. Um, and that's going to create much less of a headache when you're just trying to figure out which rules you're supposed to follow. Um, next slide, please. Um, also, I understand another reform you're looking at um, is redistricting reform that addresses gerrymandering. Um, and I just wanted to say that there are actually reforms that incorporate both ranked choice voting and gerrymandering reform. Uh, the one that my organization, Fair Vote, advocates for is a federal bill called the Fair Representation Act. It would replace um, smaller single member districts with larger multi member districts represented by multiple members. Um, and each electric delegation would be uh, elected through a variant of ranked choice voting called proportional ranked choice voting. Uh, so as you see here, I have an example of what New Jersey could look like. New Jersey currently has 12 representatives uh, with the Fair Representation Act. Um, it would have three districts and four representatives each. Um, so with proportional ranked choice voting, uh, you cast your ballot just like a regular ranked choice voting ballot, um, except the votes are tabulated in a way that since there are multiple winners, nearly all voters will help elect a candidate they support. Um, and different groups of voters, whether that's partisan, demographic, will elect winners in proportion to their share of the votes cast. Um, sort of like how we hear about proportional representation in European countries, this is a more Americanized candidate-based form of that. Uh, several US cities are already using this form, Minneapolis, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, East Point, Michigan. 
Um, and in these elections, over 80% of people see someone they ranked in their top three uh, go on to win a seat. Uh, so to do proportional ranked choice voting at the federal level, we would need to revoke a 1967 ban uh, on single member districts, but the Fair Representation Act would essentially do that. Uh, this type of reform drastically reduces the impact of gerrymandering because first of all, there's just less lines to draw, so there's less opportunity, uh, but also because proportional ranked choice voting elects candidates in proportion to their level of support, uh, no matter how you draw the lines, gerrymandering for partisan or racial advantage uh, becomes pretty impossible. Uh, also, with multi-member districts, you would have multiple candidates from each party competing on the ballot. So this means you can't just rely on partisan labels to win on the ballot. You really have to compete on the issues that matter to your constituents, uh, maybe like local business issues. Um, and also, when you're sending a delegation of representatives from the same district to Congress um, who are now going into office incentivized to be responsive to their district, what better way could they do that than working together on local issues? Uh, so overall, I think ranked choice voting is something everyone can really get on board with, but I think it has a special appeal to those of us who are impacted by the lack of consistent policy on issues we care about. And ranked choice has uh, the potential, not only the potential, but has also proved to grease the legislative process uh, and hold our politicians accountable to us again. So uh, that's all I have. I'll turn it back over to Frank for, I believe, some Q&A. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, very, very well done. I, I know that everybody here is participating appreciates all that very good uh, illustrative uh, presentation that was easy to understand. So thank you very much. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, go ahead and, and take some uh, questions. We still have uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, and Abby, will you help me look for people who want to raise their hand and ask a question? There were some questions in the chat, so we can start with those ones. Um, Jennifer? Sure. Um, my question was for uh, districts that might be doing ranked choice voting for the first time, um, you know, people will be confused. And so what happens if maybe half the people just fill out their first choice? Does that mess up the results? Um, I'm happy to take this one. Uh, yeah, with ranked choice, you can rank as many or a few candidates as you want. Um, if you only rank one or two um, and those candidates sort of don't make it to the final round, then your ballot would uh, not count towards that final round. But that's totally fine because you might just be sort of consciously indifferent between, you know, the candidates that aren't your top one, two, maybe three, third favorites. Um, it's similar to in a runoff election in Georgia. Um, if, say, your candidate gets eliminated at the general election and then you don't like like either of the other two that are there in the runoff, you just might sit home and not vote. Uh, but nonetheless, ranked choice voting, uh, at least where it replaces runoffs, solves that problem um, because the instant runoff is happening at the general election where the population, there's more people there, it's a more diverse group. Um, so it's making sure the decision is happening uh, you know, when we have the most people there um, and people are entitled to, you know, rank as few or little candidates as they want based on what their actual preferences are. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. And I'll just add to that. So it's a really important concern is like, are people going to get left behind when we switch to this process? And just a couple things I'll add to that is one is uh, what we've seen is now there's like uh, about over 60 cities, I think Rachel could tell you for sure that have adopted ranked choice voting. And it's been over a number of years. And uh, there's really great organizations like Fair Vote and like uh, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center and Democracy Rising that provide services specifically to educating voters, educating election administrators, and educating candidates about how to make that transition to the new system. And I'd say a testament to the quality of work that both these organizations and the uh, state and local governments that are adopting it is uh, the, the exit polling surveys they're getting from voters after they participated in these elections show very high rates of understanding and satisfaction with the process. Thank you very much. Abby, who's our next question from? Janice. Uh, yeah, very good presentation. Um, so what is the process for states to get ranked towards voting either at their general election or primary elections? Yeah, so it depends on the state. Actually, so a lot of how you get ranked choice voting depends on where you live and what the laws are. Uh, basically, there's, it's going to be one of two directions, either 
um, you're going to go through a legislative process where the the legislators or the city councilors, whoever's in charge of the jurisdiction, is going to to pass pass the change. You know, like pass a law that says we're going to use ranked choice voting now. Or there's going to be maybe you have a ballot a citizens initiative process in your state where your citizens are allowed to create legislation and put it on the ballot, and then you have a referendum on it. And sometimes it's a combination of the two, where like uh, the city councilors say, we think this is a good idea. We're going to put this before the voters because we're changing how they vote. We want them to weigh in. And so they'll say, uh, we're, we're putting, moving to ranked choice voting on the ballot and uh, people vote on that. So it's, it's a, a combination of one of those two ways. In North Carolina, I don't think you have the citizens initiative petition. So it would be working with your legislators to educate them and educate uh, other voters and uh, kind of go on that journey to getting everybody on board with it and getting your legislature to pass it. All right. And this question was asked more than once, so I'll just read it. What are the objections or pushback to ranked choice voting currently? Um, I guess I would say a common one is ranked choice voting is too complicated. Um, but I think, you know, that really underestimates voters. Voters know how to count to three or five or whatever choices they have. Um, I, I'll use another ice cream analogy that I like to use is if, you know, I go to the ice cream store, I might say chocolate's my favorite. Oh, if I can't have chocolate, <laughs> I guess I'll have vanilla. Uh, if there's no vanilla, I'll have strawberry. Um, and, you know, the polls show that people consistently um, understand it. Um, and enjoy it and want to use it again. Um, sometimes there might be pushback from legislators uh, because, you know, I like the system that I was elected under. It helped me win and I know how to use it. So that might happen at first. But I think that the more legislators use it, the more that they understand uh, that ranked choice voting actually gives them really good ballot data. They have very specific data about the preferences of the electorate. They can look at exactly, you know, what sort of candidates and ideologies people prefer in what order, and then use that information to act on those uh, preferences when in Congress um, and on the campaign field. So I think it's just an issue of, you know, voters like it right away. Um, candidates get used to it very quickly if they don't. Um, an example I like to use, uh, Nathan brought up Bruce Poliquin from uh, Maine 2nd District. Uh, when he first lost under ranked choice voting, he was very upset about it. Um, but now he just ran again uh, in the last general election in November, and he went on the record saying, you know, ranked choice voting, now we know what it is, we know it's easy. So um, it's something that, you know, either people come to like right away, or if they didn't, they come around to it really quickly. Thank you. And I think we had one more question in the chat from Renee. And I think the Sorry. game we're going to play here is can anyone guess what state Renee is talking about? <laughs> Go ahead, Renee. Yeah, I just, um, so it's wonderful to have, say, here's a great system. It makes a lot of sense. It's practical. It works well for everyone. And the people who are already in power say, hmm, that wouldn't work to our advantage. So no, we don't want to do it that way. And they're the ones who get to set the rules and they can do whatever they want. And so how do you make change in a situation like that? Yeah, that's a really good question, Renee. And I think it's a question that's been in front of uh, reformers on a number of issues over you know, the centuries that America's been around. Um, and, you know, one of the paths that that have been taken, you know, so with rank to vote, like there's, there's a number of um, organizations working on ranked choice voting. And we're really excited that uh, Business for Democracy might and it might be one of those. Um, they're they're kind of doing multiple different things to try to win this. One component of it is winning in states so that we can eventually get federal legislation. So maybe you're in a legislative state and you're like, my state's never going to do this. Well, we're, we're kind of take America's kind of on this journey and people like you, if you like ranked choice voting, you can work with people in your community to educate them. So as more and more people become for this thing and we start to win it in more and more states, people kind of come around on the issue, kind of like they came around with marriage equality, you know, just a couple decades ago, we lived next, next to a, a gay couple said, we're never gonna see marriage equality in our lifetime. Um, and that was, I think like a couple years before it started to roll across the country. Yeah, the civil rights movement changed things that, you know, people that were, it was a very difficult struggle, but, you know, state by state, they made changes and they, and, uh, and made some serious differences for the good. 
um, people advocating for legalization of marijuana, same process. So at Rank the Vote, we start with getting more people aware, educated, and excited about ranked choice voting so they can wait in their city or town or their state. But there's there's other groups working to help, you know, looking at the states where it's really winnable now and winning it there. And then uh, Rachel and her friends at uh, Fair Vote have been educating, um, you know, not, not just the, you know, everyday folks like ourselves, but they're even educating uh, congressional officials and their staffs and whatnot. So it's it's definitely a, a journey for for all of America, and we can we can help accelerate that by um, by educating each other. And Nathan, we got two questions we need to address. I don't want to hold everybody up. We got a couple of minutes left. Uh, the first one is about the Supreme Court. Um, you know, mandates to redraw a map, and then a state like uh, North Carolina just ignores it. Does that play into this? Yeah, I mean, certainly that's a, a problem, right? I mean, that's that's a, a real highlights a real problem with our democracy. I guess so. For there, in the, it's really disheartening to see that. That said, for every one of these, uh, you know, setbacks, there's there's a victory as well. You know, like uh, who would have thought that you know Alaska would pass ranked choice voting or that Nevada would turn around and pass ranked choice voting, and see how much people like using it. Um, you know, you know, in Ohio and North Carolina, they've had a lot of trouble with gerrymandering, and now in in Michigan, though, they seem to have, you know, passed uh, state legislation to to get fair fair districts. So you, we just got to kind of um, what we've seen in America is if people push hard enough, we can overcome the uh, some of those obstacles. And someone mentioned about legislators, you know, you know, not wanting to change this. What's encouraging to me, and especially my four years of volunteering in Massachusetts, was. Legislators are not 100% against this. There's good things in this for the two major parties, for the elected officials. It's, they've got that initial inertia to anything that changes how they get elected. But you, when, you, when they see how much, see the benefits, when, and more importantly, when they see how much their constituents are excited about this, they can get on board. And that's how in Massachusetts, we went from like nobody supporting ranked choice voting to uh, nine out of 11 of our congressional uh, representatives, both senators, six out of nine, supporting it after a campaign of a couple of years. Nathan, that, that Paul, that was from uh, Renee up in o Ohio. Uh, but with the last question we have here from uh, Jennifer and Michelle is that they have everything on the ballot at one time. All these different uh, elections that are being done on one ballot, doesn't this take forever if you got to rank uh, all the people running? Um, I'll say, yeah, so one good thing about ranked choice voting is you can only, you can rank as many or as few candidates as you want. You don't have to go through and learn about all of them um, if it's a really long ballot. Uh, some places navigate this by having a ranking limit. So say you can only rank three, four, or five candidates to help keep the ballot um, a little bit longer and cleaner, or sorry, shorter and cleaner and easier to navigate. Um, so there's definitely solutions to that, but I like that, you know, it gives people the option to express more specific preferences if they want to. Um, but, you know, at the worst, they just rank one candidate and it's no, you know, worse than our current electoral system. So, uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. And we're at time, uh, but the question that Michelle also asked is what can we do to help? And I think that's what we're, we're doing here with our Business for Democracy folks. Uh, you know, we have to decide where we're going in 2023, 2024. Uh, and that's why I wanted you all to have this presentation so that we can make a collective decision on, on how we want to move forward. So I hope everybody appreciated uh, Nathan and Rachel's presentation. I think it was wonderful, uh, easy to understand, uh, certainly clearly about, uh, as, as Rachel said, the re-democratization of elections. Uh, and uh, it really makes for a better democracy instead of only having a, a handful of people over here, a handful of people over there, make decisions of who we all can vote for. Uh, that doesn't seem very democratic. Uh, and it gives us a, a, another uh, avenue of continuing to raise the issue of protecting democracy by proposing some uh, ways of at the state level to actually support uh, a strong democracy. So thank you all very much. Uh, please uh, email me. Uh, or Abby, uh, if you have questions, you want to have a discussion about this. Uh, we will going to look at uh, doing another webinar in the first Wednesday in uh, in February uh, to continue this discussion. But uh, I'll probably be polling you uh, to ask you what you think about is this some something the way move forward with our business for democracy. 
uh, campaign. And I'm going to we're going to share the uh, the video of this with everybody also, so you can help distribute it. Uh, so thank you, appreciate it, uh, and we will we'll be talking with you later. Thank you for your great participation, and thanks to our wonderful experts. Thank you. Bye for now.